Welcome and thank you for joining us for the Psychosocial and Ethics Community of Practice webinar, Ethical Issues in Organ Transplantation with Undocumented Immigrants. Before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. Currently, there is a poll on your screen. Um, this is used to get an idea of how many people are viewing with us today. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be posted to the Psychosocial and Ethics COP Hub next week. Please note that all of your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the archive recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the Journal Club, we encourage you to participate by using the questions section in the Zoom webinar panel to submit your questions for consideration. Questions submitted via the chat button may be missed. If there are questions we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the website following the webinar. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's webinar, you will see a link to a short survey to complete. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn over the session to the co-chair of the Psychosocial and Ethics COP, Dr. Elisa Gordon. Hi, I'm Elisa Gordon. I'm the co-chair of the Psychosocial and Ethics Community of Practice and the organizer of this ethics webinar. So welcome to the ethical issues in organ transplantation with undocumented immigrants. I would like to welcome all of the attendees. We've got a phenomenal turnout today. I'm so excited. And I wanted to extend a very warm thanks to our excellent lineup of panelists and to our moderator. Uh, we're going to keep our Q&A to the very end, and I encourage everyone to participate in the discussion. So in the interest of time, each panelist will briefly introduce themselves, and we'll start off with Dr. Klassen. Uh, could you please start it off? Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, can you see my slides? No, I don't believe I can. Cannot? No. I still see Elisa's. Um, here, let me. All right. All right. How about now? I don't believe so. Anybody else mm -hmm. getting David's slides yet? No. OK. Um, let me try again. There you go. Or now we have your home screen. Yeah, okay. Great. You see my slides now? Yes. yes. Ah, great, okay. Uh, thank you, sorry for the slow start there. Uh, my name is David Clausen. I am the uh, Chief Medical Officer at UNOS. And um, what I'm gonna do today really is just kind of set the stage and I wanna give you sort of a little background on the policy that's relevant to this discussion and also pre present uh, some of the data that we currently have uh, collected through the OPTN. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, this issue is really not a new issue at all. It goes back all the way to the very beginning of the OPTN. Uh, the OPTN was uh, created by an act of Congress in 1984, and they set up a task force uh, to, set it, to set this up. Um, and the issue was very much a real issue back then. Um, at that point, the, the decision was made specifically uh, and consciously to allow the transplantation of some non-resident foreign nationals. Um, this, I think, was done in the sense of, you know, there was a realization that transplantation uh, was not widely available at that point, at least for some organs uh, throughout the world. And there was the, 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 the idea that we needed to be able to provide this on occasion. Uh, there was a minority dissenting opinion that said we wouldn't transplant any non-citizens, uh, but that really was not finally um, established. Um, there was a threshold that was set uh, uh, to balance the needs of citizens and non-citizens. Um, so this, uh, the, this initial policy defined citizenship. Uh, it also defined resident aliens, either documented uh, uh, for long-term residency or the ability to have insurance in the U.S. and then non-resident aliens. Um, and interestingly, it set an audit threshold of 10% uh, of non-residents transplanted by any given program. Uh, this was not a policy uh, um, a limit, but really just an audit trigger. 
Um, and really the, the fundamental issue was uh, maintaining a non-discrimination policy that citizenship was to play no role in the listing or matching uh, uh, process. Uh, this issue continued to smolder, however, and in 1994, there was additional uh, discussion about it. There was a House bill uh, to amend NOTA, the, the original um, uh, legislation, uh, to have two allocation lists, citizens before any non-citizen. Uh, there was a Senate bill to study, uh, to, to make a commission to study this, uh, but uh, it all fell apart and never really, uh, there was no specific action. Interestingly, the quote audit threshold was uh, lowered to 5% non-residents uh, transplanted by any given program. Um, there's actually been a lot of confusion around this 5% rule, if you will. Um, a lot of people have assumed that there was a policy that uh, that limited um, specifically the number of transplants uh, for non-residents or for non-citizens to this two five percent. That actually is not true at all. There is no prohibition uh, for transplanting more than five percent of your of, uh, of non non-citizens. Um, it is just a trigger. So uh, that's all it is. It triggers uh, potentially a review of of, pro of the program activities. Um, it's kind of interesting, small programs such as intestinal transplants really have, have sort of gone above this 5% uh, threshold uh, more than others. And that has to do with sort of the demand within this country and the availability in other countries as well. Um, referral to the Membership and Professional Standards Committee is possible, however, uh, if, if the uh, our review um, suggests that that might be reasonable. Um, the, there is an OPTN committee, the Ad Hoc International Relations Committee, um, that reviews citizenship data reported to the OPTN, um, and the um, IRC may request uh, host, transplant hospitals to voluntarily provide additional information. Um, uh, citizenship uh, uh, data is collected for deceased donors, um, and you can see how, this, how it is categorized here. Um, on this slide, this is how candidate registrations are collected. Uh, U.S. citizen, non-U.S. citizen, U.S. resident, um, uh, non-U.S. citizen uh, traveling uh, for the reasons for transplants and uh, non-citizens traveling for reasons other than transplant. Um, this is the most recent data from the most recent report. And so in 2018, and I want to just give a, a sense of, of the scale of what is actually happening across the country. So there were 63,000 uh, registrations. This is new registrations in 2018, um, and 1.4% were for candidates not residing in the United States, um, and 0.4% uh, were candidates specifically in the U.S. for transplant. Uh, this is a little bit of data by organ. Um, you can see there were 1.6% was for kidney, 101% uh, uh, for liver, um, and then smaller numbers for other, um, for other organs. Um, interestingly, it's not a rare phenomenon to have uh, non-citizens uh, on list. 54% of all transplant hospitals have at least one registration, um, and there were 10 hospitals uh, that had 5% um, or more uh, on some of their programs. And you can see the number of programs listed here. Um, and this is the number of transplants uh, in 2018, 1.4% uh, were for res recipients uh, not residing in the US and 0.4% were in the US specifically for transplant. And there's some living donor data there as well. And so I think I'll stop there and uh, uh, went over slightly, uh, but um, um, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And with that, we'll pass it over to uh, Lely Cervantes. Hi, everyone. Do you see my, my uh, slides okay? And can you hear me okay? We both, yes. Awesome, great. My name is Lelia Cervantes and I am an internal medicine hospitalist physician and health services researcher at Denver Health, which is the safety net hospital here in Colorado. And today I'm presenting on undocumented immigrants with kidney failure specifically. I have no conflicts of interest. Um, so the rest of us following Dr. Klassen's excellent presentation were asked to present an ethical situation we encountered, how we conceptualized the ethical dilemma 
our response, the outcome of the patient, and the residual effect on the team. And so with that in mind, I want to start with Hilda's story. Some of you may have heard her story before. Um, Hilda was an undocumented immigrant single mother of two kiddos, and she had kidney failure and no access to standard kidney replacement therapy, including kidney transplantation, because she was undocumented and had no benefits. And so as a result, she came to our hospital once a week to receive emergency dialysis. And this basically happened every time she was sort of near death or critically ill. Um, over time, Hilda um, became more ill and eventually suffered three cardiac arrests. And she, at that time, made the very difficult decision as a mother that she would preemptively stop emergency dialysis. Um, she saw how distressing this was for her boys. Each week, they wondered if their mom would survive to the following week. Um, they were refusing to go to school because they didn't want to leave her side for fear she could have a heart attack and no one would be around. And so um, she preemptively decided to stop emergency dialysis. Um, I took custody of her boys and we helped her interview different um, parents until she found the right ones. She had a very large Christmas party, spent some time in the mountains, and then stopped emergency dialysis on Mother's Day in 2014. And so this clinical challenge and ethical dilemma basically changed everyone who took care of her. Um, many of us found it extremely morally distressing to continue to provide this type of care um, for the other patients that were just like Hilda that came to our hospital. To conceptualize this dilemma, what we needed to do was to sort of understand the policies within our hospital, within the state, and at the federal level. At the time in our state, there were about 140 undocumented immigrants with kidney failure, about 70 to 80 at Denver Health. As I mentioned, they had to be critically ill to receive dialysis, meaning high potassium, hypoxia, shortness of breath, severe uremic symptoms. And when a patient was critically ill, they were admitted to the hospital, had two consecutive dialysis sessions, and were then discharged. What happened over time is that due to the limited number of dialysis chairs and the growing number of patients, we oftentimes had to turn visibly ill patients away from the ED. And so this was becoming more and more difficult. And across the country, there are about six to 9,000 patients just like Hilda with kidney failure. They tend to be Latino. Half of them are employed because they have no benefits. The majority live in poverty and the majority have been in the country for at least five years before being diagnosed with kidney failure. Um, the data I'm presenting is on kidney failure. There's much less data on uh, undocumented immigrants in need of a liver, heart, or lung transplant. And so after Hilda passed away, the interdisciplinary team that provided care for her on a weekly basis was devastated. Hospital medicine, nephrology, emergency medicine, the dietitians, social workers, all of us. And so our team's response to this was to do advocacy locally. However, this only got us so far. And so um, over time, we read everything possible on this issue and came across a very important article written by Dr. Straub, who at the time was the CMO for CMS. And in it, he challenged people to do more research on this issue um, that would drive a change in health policy. And so after a lot of soul searching, I um, decreased my clinical time and transitioned to research with the sole purpose of changing exactly this. Um, in this slide, the picture on the left is of a death altar we dedicated to celebrate Hilda's life, and the picture on the right is from her last Christmas party. Um, the patients themselves were central to all of this work. Um, it was Hilda who had inspired all of this work and the patients, and so this first study really centered the margins. Um, I conducted qualitative interviews with 20 patients and asked them about their experiences receiving emergency dialysis. And they described struggling with severe physical and psychosocial distress because they had to wait for their symptoms to accumulate on a weekly basis. In engaging patients, we formed a social and emotional support group. Um, the patients uh, became very close and uh, 
created their own club and um, social media group. And we also formed a WhatsApp group where we were sort of kept up to date on all the advocacy and civic engagement around this. The family members were also deeply engaged and asked to be interviewed. And so we conducted qualitative interviews also with the primary family caregivers. And many of them were young spouses who described um, similar psychosocial distress in their children, um, who oftentimes had to drop out of school to work or also provide care at home. Providing this type of care was very distressing for all clinicians. Um, in this study, I explored the perspectives of 50 interdisciplinary clinicians, so social workers, registered dietitian, dietitians, everyone that provided care for this community. And we identified several drivers of professional burnout, including emotional exhaustion from witnessing needless suffering and high mortality, jeopardizing patients' trust, physical exhaustion from overextending themselves to bridge care, and to numb themselves from feeling too much empathy, many individuals described detaching themselves from their patients. And one clinician said, emergency dialysis makes us feel very inhuman, and I don't like calling it compassionate dialysis. We're torturing them. We also engaged other um, stakeholders, including health policy folks, and they asked us to look into mortality. And so in this study, this is a retrospective mortality study, we, have, we found that undocumented immigrants have a 14-fold greater mortality five years after initiating dialysis compared to those that receive standard dialysis. We conducted an internal cost analysis and found that there was a strong incentive to continue to provide this type of care within our hospital because our hospital was making so much from this. Each time a patient was admitted, the DRG for this was severe life-threatening hyperkalemia, which carried a reimbursement of about six to 8,000 per patient. And so, uh, you know, if a patient is being admitted once a week, um, over a month, we would make about 24,000 or 288,000 per year. And in our cost analysis, we found that we were actually making 15 million per year. So this would be potential savings for the state and a loss for the hospital and helped us understand that the most important stakeholder in changing this was our chief financial officer. Um, lastly, we conducted a policy analysis. As many of you know, undocumented immigrants are excluded from Medicaid, most, or actually, they're excluded from Medicare, most Medicaid programs, and the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. And um, for this reason, many undocumented immigrants have to seek emergency care because they can only uh, receive care that's reimbursed through emergency Medicaid. What I have on this side is the uh, EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act language from 1986. And this law basically established emergency Medicaid programs for each state. And what's interesting is that most states adopted this exact language. However, some states modified the qualifying conditions that fall under emergency Medicaid, such as Washington State, which includes dialysis treatment and anti-rejection medication for an organ transplant. And so, um, you know, after- So sorry to interrupt, Lily, just uh, time, so close time to wrap up. Yep. Um, and so after several stakeholder meetings, we were able to change this in 2019, which is just about five years after Hilda passed away. And so there were three important um, uh, keys in changing this, which was gathering a coalition, gathering the data, and then presenting all of this to our state uh, Medicaid um, office. The outcome of this has been that uh, patients described an improvement in quality of life and an improvement in symptoms. Um, we found in Colorado that access to dialysis leads to transplantation of undocumented immigrants. Many of them have enrolled in private health insurance off the marketplace exchange, which is paid for by the American Kidney Fund, and they use their tax ID numbers because they have no social security number. And so now the efforts are really focused on providing them with culturally responsive care and addressing distrust to get them on our transplant list. Uh, the team has been successful in identifying uh, patients 
uh, that were slow in their, in their progress for listing and invited them to attend support groups. We have a Hispanic kidney transplant program led by Dr. Monica Grafals, who has been extremely successful in creating a bilingual interdisciplinary team that does a lot of community outreach. And lastly, in summary, um, what I described as sort of an ethical dilemma and how we conceptualized it, our response and the outcomes in Colorado, which has led to increased transplantation for this community. Um, the, the, the next steps are sort of um, the greatest challenge, which is structural across the country. And so for this, my perspective is that we need to change healthcare coverage at the federal level. Um, and TALA specifically excludes transplantation benefits. And so I think this is sort of the next step. Um, and lastly, I think we need more research. I'm particularly interested in the justice argument. Um, undocumented immigrants can and do gift organs in our country and any system that uses organ gifts of individuals who would themselves not be considered eligible for an organ transplant because of inability to pay due to immigration is unjust. Um, many of you know there are 16 states in the country where undocumented immigrants can sign up for a license and preemptively decide that they want to be organ donators. And so I'll end with a quote. Um, this quote is from a patient that I interviewed while he was receiving emergency dialysis describing his near-death experiences. And he said, but if the time comes and if I can't be resuscitated and if I die, as I said, I, I'll donate my organs, which could be useful. Maybe they won't be useful because I'm too old, but hopefully they are useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cervantes. Uh, now we'll pass it over to Laura. And Laura Stillian, if you would uh, please turn on your video and share your screen when you have the ability to do so. Good afternoon. Are you able to see my screen? We are. Um, you're still in uh, remote mode. Uh, so if you could bring up slideshow, I think we'll be all set. There we go. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share a story um, of one of our patients. My name is Laura Stillian, and I'm the administrator um, for all solid organ transplant programs at the Ohio State University Medical Center. Um, I too do not um, have any financial arrangements to disclose. And um, just as Dr. Cervantes, I am sharing a story about one of our patients today. Um, and Laura, I'm sorry, before you go on, I think you're, you're in notes mode. So I'm wondering if we could go full screen with your slides. And if not, it should be okay, but make it easier to see. Hmm, we could if I knew how to do that. Olivia or Brian, do you have suggestions for the? Sure, if you could just exit out of the uh, um, this mode right here. Let's see. I, I apologize, end slideshow. Sure. Um, if you go down to the bottom where uh, the bottom right where you clicked on the slides, uh, the notes in the beginning, there's one that's a read mode. Uh, I think the icon next to the one. If you just click on that, that'll suffice for the presentation. Reading view? Yes, please. Okay. And you'll that be able to advance cool. the slides in the same mode. Perfect. All right. Great. Apologize for that. Um, so today I'd like to share a story that is uh, somewhat similar to the last story. Um, in April of 2017, we had a, a Hispanic gentleman um, that was referred for transplant evaluation, a 30-year-old male um, with diagnosis of uh, type 2 diabetes and also dialyzing, similar to the previous presentation, um, and presenting um, in a very similar way to emergency departments um, on a regular basis to obtain his dialysis treatments. Um, he presented um, with a very good support system um, of uh, mother, sister-in-law, sister, and um, his significant other, in which they had three uh, small children in the household. Um, his sister was willing to be a living donor, um, and if not compatible, uh, she was very willing to go into an exchange program if she felt that that would be helpful. Um, the patient reports um, his highest level of education was middle school but he had a very good understanding of his health issues. 
his primary language, language was Spanish, but he spoke um, very fluent English. He did utilize a medical interpreter for some complex issues to make sure um, that he had full understanding, but was very engaged um, in his care and understood um, that it was a significant health issue and, and was really eager to make progress um, in solving it. Um, he was very forthcoming about not being eligible for Medicare or Medicaid due to his undocumented immigration status. Um, and he was, um, at the current time, paying out of pocket for his health care coverage via a very limited um, option for him, um, given the status of his um, immigration status of both himself as well as his family. Um, reports from the dialysis center um, regarding this patient included that, um, interestingly, although he was very engaged in his care from the standpoint of understanding it and knowing the severity of it, um, he was not adherent to his salt intake, his fluid restrictions, and his medication adherence. Um, his BMI continued to be high, relatively high, and he often routinely ended treatments early uh, due to cramping and sporadically missed uh, treatment appointments. And so we felt like um, the story didn't really match with what we were seeing um, when we met him in person um, and, and came to find out that um, he owned a small or owns, so currently owns a small landscaping company. And this gentleman was actively working six days a week in the heat and humid conditions. Um, and we as a team talked about just how challenging it had to been for him to manage all of these things, right? So he was running a small business. He himself was physically doing this, you know, very challenging work in the heat with fluid restrictions um, and having a hard time getting enough, you know, significant food consumption to maintain um, enough energy um, to, to perform the work and keep this business in which he employed about 20 people up and running. And um, it sure helped us understand how and why he was missing appointments um, because he was trying to run this business and, and keep, he had a lot of commitment to keeping the people that he had employed, um, employed. And so he uh, did not really feel very hopeful that he'd be able to get a transplant. Um, and so because of these things, he said, you know, I understand that I'm sick and I understand that these are the things that I need to do, but I have these life pressures that are making this very difficult for, for me and, and for my people um, that I'm employing. So the, the dilemma, the ethical situation was that our multidisciplinary team um, had obvious concerns about the reports that we received from the dialysis facilities, but we also thought we need to dig a little bit deeper here to see how might we be able to help um, this gentleman because it seems like he really is committed to getting better, but his behavior right now is not really demonstrating that. So we really had kind of three options. The first was to present the patient to patient selection committee um, and accept that committee's outcome, which would very likely, given the data that we had, um, be a decline, right? Um, the second option was to give the patient some specific instructions and send him back to the dialysis facility until he was able to resolve um, his immigration issue, as well as demonstrate a year's worth of 100% compliance with his medication and his dialysis regimen and show improvement um, with his BMI. And the third was to establish some kind of structured plan with him that had some clear timelines and some clear milestones of what he needed to achieve and work with him um, as well as representatives from the Ohio Hispanic Coalition to increase the chances of this patient's success. And so we, we'd become aware of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. Um, they had reached out to us. And so we utilized this case really as our test case to say, can we partner with the Ohio Hispanic Coalition to help, um, to help these patients navigate their way through this process? And so our team, after lots of debate, um, decided to go with option three. Um, and the concerns that our team expressed were um, his ability to adhere to instructions based on his, um, his past, what he had demonstrated, the insurance coverage, as mentioned um, by Dr. Cervantes, was a, a big issue 
um, mostly from the standpoint of we knew that he would have readmissions and we knew obviously immunosuppression was going to be a huge factor that we needed to have solved before he received transplant. And so that was definitely um, a concern for the team. And then also um, he was the sole source provider and the impact that that, that would have on his ability to maintain coverage. And then um, again, lots of discussion of, about his actual immigration status. So as I mentioned, our team um, elected to, we really wanted to forge a relationship with the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. And so we asked this patient, can we kind of really use you as our test case to see if we can partner and not only help you, but then obviously help um, additional people um, um, who have similar circumstances. So, uh, we had several individuals from our transplant team that formed a partnership, if you will, with the coalition um, and this patient. And we developed a six month compliance plan that included um, his medical appointments, dialysis treatments, which also included the patient endorsing um, and initialing the completed treatment information that's documented in his record, his medication adherence, demonstrated continued improvement of his labs improving, his dietary um, adherence improving, as well as his fluid restrictions uh, improving. We needed to see some progress towards his BMI goal. And we were um, very adamant that he needed to establish an ongoing relationship with the primary care provider. Um, he had trust issues, which is often, as you all know, very common um, in this patient population with um, establishing regular medical care. Um, and we also needed him to really work on resolution of his lack of insurance and his immigration um, issue. We were able through working with the Ohio Hispanic Coalition to help him um, get to some legal resources that could assist him with um, submitting his application for um, citizenship. And so this is the plan that we developed um, and we started on this journey with him. And, and as of today, the patient has successfully um, been transplanted. He's post -year, two years post-transplant from actually a DCD donor. He has been very adherent with his medical regimen um, and he has fully returned back to work. And uh, the Ohio Hispanic Coalition really did assist him um, with his immigration, his immigration status, and that has been resolved. And um, the pre-transplant issues are still present with respect to his BMI. He has plateaued, but he definitely did show us progress, um, not only pre-transplant, but post-transplant. So overall, he did very well, um, and we are very happy for him. We're happy that we were able to establish this relationship with the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. He has really helped us move um, this relationship forward and we continue to partner with them for patients that have um, been in similar situations since um, this patient presented several years ago. And so we continue to look forward to an ongoing relationship. Um, and he is helping us to mentor with some other patients who have similar circumstances and helping to walk them through the process as well alongside of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. So that, that's the story of our team. Um, they're very happy that we um, took the chance with this gentleman and tried to pave this path and now really kind of use him um, as our gold rod standard for how we're gonna help um, patients with immigration status issues to get access to this um, much needed care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. I'll we'll ask that we unshare screen and we'll pass it over to Aaron Whiteman. Whenever you're ready, Aaron. Thank you, Brendan. And, and I'd like to begin by, by thanking uh, AST and the organizers of this session for uh, providing a platform to discuss this important topic and inviting me to participate. Uh, my name is Aaron Whiteman. Uh, I'm from the University of Washington and the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics at Seattle Children's Hospital. I have uh, no relevant financial uh, relationships to disclose, but it is probably worth disclosing that I'm a pediatric nephrologist by training. Uh, but the case I'll be discussing uh, this afternoon was a case that involved a child who needed a heart transplant. This is a case uh, that I and my mentor, Doug Diekma, uh, were actually involved with as ethics consultants. 
Uh, we wrote about this experience a number of years ago. The, the question that was posed to us is, is it fair or just to accept a 17 year old who is an undocumented immigrant as a transplant candidate if she may not be able to pay for medications once she turns 21? The patient in this case was a 17 year old young woman with single ventricle Fontan physiology that was failing. Her course was complicated by significant protein losing enteropathy, severe tricuspid regurgitation and decreasing cardiac function. The heart team had diagnosed her with end stage heart disease and it was felt that she would require a heart transplant if she were to survive to adulthood. Now, because of her anatomy, she carried a slightly higher risk for a poorer outcome from a heart transplant. And it was thought that this risk would increase if transplant were delayed. In spite of this, the cardiac team considers the patient an acceptable medical candidate for transplant. And after discussion of the risks and benefits of a transplant, the patient and her parents indicated that they would like to pursue a heart transplant. Now the patient had received her first heart surgery outside of the United States, but had been followed at this particular heart center since the age of six, and had received a number of surgical palliative procedures. The patient, her parents, and two of her siblings are undocumented immigrants. Both parents were employed as seasonal agricultural workers in a rural community several hours away from the medical center. The patient and her siblings are DACA eligible. However, she lives in a state where DACA status excludes her from qualifying for Medicaid or Medicare. She has a younger sibling who was born in the United States and is an American citizen. The patient is a junior in high school and was a good student before progression of her heart disease precluded continued attendance at school. As discussed by each of the other presenters, money was a significant factor in this case. Actually, for this patient, the Children's Hospital had committed to providing care and medications until she turned 21. The Milliman Group estimated the cost of heart transplant uh, at this time was approximately $1 million in the first year and about $30,000 uh, per year subsequently. Once the patient turned 21, however, she would no longer be followed at the Children's Hospital and the transplant team did not believe any adult hospital could, make, could or would make a similar commitment. Their concerns then is that after the patient turned 21, she would not no longer have access, she would not have access to health insurance. She would not be able to afford immune suppressive medications or pay for medical care and the allograph would fail. The question then again posed to us was, is it a just and fair distribution of a scarce resource, a heart allograph to allocate an organ to a patient predicted to lose the ability to pay for the treatment needed to maintain the transplant in less than four years? Other questions that came up in our conversations with the team included how to define likelihood of success of a transplant, how to weigh short-term versus long-term benefits of a transplant candidate, how to weigh a need for advocacy versus the present realities faced by a patient and her family, and most significantly, how to weigh uncertainty when considering transplant candidacy. In our analysis, we started by reviewing relevant policy as reviewed earlier by Dr. Klassen, along with the published literature, including a particularly good paper written by uh, Dr. Aviva Goldberg, uh, Dr. Mary Simmerling, and Dr. Joel Freider in transplantation in 2007. Our analysis began with considerations of reasons to include a patient with organ failure who is an undocumented immigrant as a potential transplant candidate, beginning with considerations of solidarity the principle of solidarity suggests that although it is not necessary for a group to contribute organs to the donor pool to be candidates, it does increase the claim that this group be considered. As mentioned by others, undocumented immigrants can and do donate to the deceased donor pool and contribute to social security and other entitlements through sales tax, property tax, and payroll taxes. Further, we should recognize that the, this patient and her family were contributing members of our community and all members of a community should have the opportunity to have their health protected as a matter of reciprocity. As brought up by the other speakers, ultimately this case was not really about citizenship. It was about ability to pay for a transplant. Now rationing organs by ability to pay is different than rationing other medical resources by ability to pay. Organs are a limited national resource donated by the population that by law have no monetary value. Simply having the ability to pay for the transplant does not make more organs available 
in the way that paying for other medical procedures can make the purchase or manufacture of more of that resource available. One could argue the principle of solidarity applies here as well as any system, as Dr. Cervantes said, that uses organs of an individual who would not themselves be considered eligible for a transplant because of inability to pay is clearly unjust. But not only was our case about ability to pay, it was really about ability to pay in the future rather uniquely. And this isn't about certainty then. What this case really was about is uncertainty, an uncertain likelihood of benefit for transplant with immigration status used as proxy for likelihood of benefit. And I think that's problematic. We should recognize that an uncertain future is a characteristic of all transplant candidates. All transplants are characterized by uncertainty. We can never be certain, sorry for the repetition, about future insurance status, adherence, or whether a transplant recipient will develop habits or unrelated medical conditions that jeopardize the health of the graft. These concerns then are highly speculative at best. In our patient's case, there was no way of knowing how her life might change in the following four years. She could petition to become a citizen. We could have meaningful immigration or healthcare reform. It was possible, uh, making her eligible for Medicare or Medicaid. She could obtain insurance or means to pay for medications and care out of pocket through employment. Ultimately, we concluded that denying a transplant to anyone requires compelling reasons and should not be based on concerns of a worst case scenario alone. In this case, the patient was ultimately listed and did receive a heart transplant. Her course was complicated by her mother being deported and significant barriers previously unrecognized to adherence, such as relying on limited social supports available for transportation to clinic, labs, and pharmacy, and the ability to have and pay for a working phone. The patient ultimately did uh, was a successful recipient and did transplant transfer to an adult transplant program. Looking back at this case, it offered an important opportunity for transplant members to discuss moral distress. The moral distress of knowing what the right thing to do was for this patient, but feeling constrained or powerless in our ability to do it. It also offered an opportunity to express gratitude at the immense resources available at our institution which at the time had a mandate of providing care to all children who reside within our region, and also a reflection that such resources are not available at many and in fact, most other centers in the country. And also an opportunity to promote discussion between our organ transplant services, as our kidney and liver transplant services had more experience working with this population of patients who needed organ transplants. With that, I'll thank you for your attention. I'll thank a number of co-authors and mentors, uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Aaron. If we could ask all of our panelists to turn their video cameras back on and we can begin the discussion. I'll ask uh, all of the participants that if you have questions, please type them in via the Q and A function. Um, and we will get into our conversation here. So thank you so much to uh, David, Lilia, Laura, and Aaron um, for the incredibly insightful and motivating uh, descriptions. Uh, for me, it's interesting to be, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'll start. I'm Brendan Perrin. I'm a professor of medical ethics in the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and I direct transplant ethics and policy research here. So this issue is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, so it's interesting to be giving this panel through under the auspices of the, uh, the ethics community of practice, because for me, there is an, uh, an interesting adjacency between issues of ethics and issues of advocacy, right? And issues in this distinction that I create, issues of ethics are hard questions and we don't know the right answer and whether we need to do something. And advocacy really is, we know what needs to happen. We just need to know how to get there. We need to know how to address the structural barriers to solve the problem. Um, and uh, it seems pretty clear that I'm not alone in this position, at least in terms of the panel members here. Um, but I do know that there are probably some in the community, if not some in the audience, who might push back on that notion and have questions. Going back to David's point, the original task force, which was you know the minority, the dissenting opinion, whether 
uh, we, we should be transplanting non-residents, undocumented individuals. And where does that stem from? It, this, I, I can't help but draw a parallel to the vaccine allocation uh, uh, situation, which we're facing or have been facing, um, and descriptions about uh, duties to one's own country people versus duty to the globe, right? Duty to, to human beings writ large. And uh, for me, this is relevant insofar as uh, we need to help everyone. Obviously, the, the, the parallel has limits, um, uh, but, but the, the duty to steward a resource responsibly um, is, is the same, but we need to help everyone, right? Uh, it's also different when it comes to organ transplant in some ways because uh, organs are not universally uh, exchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, and if organs are going to be compatible with an individual, um, an undocumented individual, uh, that doesn't mean that they're gonna be available to a resident. Um, and to, to Aaron's points of reciprocity and a number of the uh, participants um, have asked questions about reciprocity, the fact that uh, undocumented individuals can donate their organs, um, but are significantly less um, uh, 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 eligible for organ transplant, is that fair? The fact that they are contributing members of society, right? What other arguments are there to suggest that such individuals shouldn't be made more eligible? And so with that, I will acknowledge that, that all individuals on this panel have talked about ways in which they have created advocacy for patients and have tried to make change in their systems. Um, what are the key features of your advocacy platforms that have been successful, right? And what are the key challenges you have run up against? Uh, Lily mentioned uh, the CFO and how that was one of the key stakeholders that you would have to convince, right? Because of the amount of money, it sounds like, that the, the institution was making from dialysis. So I'll start, I'll start with Lily and say, um, and ask, uh, did you have direct conversations with the CFO? What, what were your pathways to, um, to making change or trying to uh, have a positive impact on this issue in your system? Thank you, Brendan. That's an excellent question. And um, I will say that since the um, self-regulatory language change in Colorado, um, interdisciplinary clinicians from other states have reached out because they're wanting to similarly change access to care following the same algorithm because it doesn't take legislative action, because it is just a sub-regulatory language change. And so what I typically recommend is that they begin by understanding the policies within their hospital and then the state policies. And what I mean by the policies within the hospital, it's understanding why care is provided the way it is. At my hospital, we had to admit them overnight so that it would qualify as an inpatient admission and trigger uh, emergency Medicaid. Other states don't require an admission. And so it's really important to understand sort of the costs behind this or the reimbursement uh, behind this, because at the end of the day, what drives this type of care is the bottom line. And, um, and, and then separate from that, uh, as far as the stakeholder engagement, it's important to understand the levels of influence of each of the stakeholders. And so, you know, in understanding the policies within my hospital, um, you know, it became clear to me that the CFO was the most important person. And I engaged her as a clinician, sharing Hilda's story, sharing all of my patient's stories, and describing the tremendous burnout that interdisciplinary clinicians were facing, because we would literally see them code in our emergency departments when they were hyperkalemic, and then discharge them from the hospital when they were breathing and talking in full sentences and participating with their families. And so I basically came to her with those patient stories, and she decided that um, it was more important to do right by our patients than to make this amount of money. 
And um, there's a quote that I have in one of my slides that I sometimes present. Uh, but after the health policy change, um, there were, you know, some urgent executive staff meetings because this was such an important change. And she basically, she basically stood up and said, I am not going to lose a minute of sleep over the millions in dollars lost because it's like saying we are going to stop waterboarding. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, if there are other clinicians interested in this type of change, um, get to know the um, stakeholders, um, you know, invite people to the table and, um, you know, learn from each other's expertise and build that coalition and, you know, to understand uh, the exact steps that are needed for this. It's, it's very helpful, Lily. Um, I, I want to be cognizant of our remaining time. We have about 10 minutes, uh, just letting our, our, uh, our technical people know I'm on it. Um, L Laura, you also have created a pretty extraordinary advocacy team to get your patient transplanted. Um, but as we know, different transplant institutes are differently resourced, right? They have different capacities to take on the risk, even if they wanted to, right? So is there anything that we could recommend, whether it's uh, Laura, Lily, or anyone, um, for, for smaller programs or institutes uh, to help make patients eligible? Yeah, I think, I think fundamentally, everyone wants to help. Everyone wants to help. So I looked at this as what can I do to remove the barriers to saying no, right? So what are those things? Let's identify what those things are and let's just plug away at removing them so that we can bring the case forward as, as Dr. Cervantes said. Because I do fundamentally think that everyone, no one wants to have this type of patient and, and um, lay their head on the pillow and think, I didn't do enough to try to help this person, this human being. And at least in our case, when we learned the rest of his story, that he literally was working six days a week and to ask this person who is working this hard to have fluid restrictions and not mistreatments, it just, it just didn't make sense to us. And so, so our thinking was just as I said, okay, well, what are the obstacles we're gonna come up against and, and let's just solve one problem after the next until we get to yes. So that's perfect. And, and zooming down into one of those micro issues, we have a question from one of our participants, specifically what interventions were used to reduce the patient's sodium and water intake while he's doing this grueling work and to increase his adherence to treatment? Sure. So we, we partnered him with coaches um, and he got really so engaged. We have letters from his dietitians, letters from his, like everyone endorsing He's doing this, he's working on this, his lab values, we watched his lab values continue to come down. So we really just shepherded him through the process. Um, that's the easiest way for me to explain it. We have um, examples of letters from his fitness place where he was going and regularly participating in, in regular exercise. I mean, when he knew we were behind him, he got behind himself and that just um, grew exponentially, so. That's great. Um, th there's a question here about whether there's been any discussion or any knowledge about undocumented immigrants serving as living donors, as opposed to deceased donors. Do any of you have experience um, with that circumstance? I know that in NYU, there are a number who do serve as living donors, often to their friends and relatives, but we actually do have some examples of altruistic uh, undocumented uh, immigrants, and this has served as quite a quite an ethically challenging case for us. Anybody else experience anything? Yeah, we certainly have uh, parents who happen to be undocumented who serve as donors. And does that, Aaron, does that uh, create any conversation during your your committee meetings um, uh, in, in, on the reciprocity front? This actually is where, where I get to, to say that I'm a pediatrician and I don't and should not participate in those discussions about whether a parent be permitted to donate. Uh, I'll tell you that I, I, I don't frame my discussion about being a potential living donor differently when I introduce the concept, when I discuss the concept of transplant with a patient I expect will uh, go on to need one in the future. 
So there are a number um, of questions about um, uh, countrywide reform, right? How do we advocate, one, for the kind of change we want to see at the federal level? And two, what would that change look like? I'll pitch this question uh, to, to David, if you're willing to, to take, take this on. Well, thank you. That's a difficult uh, question, honestly. Yeah, it's um, awful. Um, you know, I, I think that's, from the OPTN perspective, I think the OPTN is really sort of agnostic in, in these kinds of discussions. I mean, you know, citizenship, documentation status doesn't have any role in terms of you know, allocation. We collect data around it. Uh, it isn't, there's no sort of policy thing. You know, how to how to address this, uh, you know, access to the wait list essentially is what you're talking about on a national level, you know, it, it, it's really difficult. It, it, it's an issue, not just for undocumented, you know, people, but for, for Americans as well, uh, for citizens as well. And, you know, how, how to, you know, reform healthcare financing, you know, and, and turn that into, you know, equitable access uh, for, for, people you know, to the wait list, I, I think is an enormous challenge and it is way bigger than transplantation. And you know, I, I, I confess I'm not, not the one who is gonna be able to, to answer that question for you. So we, we can broaden it and I apologize for putting you on the spot there. I think as you, as you mentioned, access to the wait list is, is one thing, but what, what are some of the, the barriers or the, the preconceived notions about why there should be these barriers. Um, and some of the questions on the list also really get specifically to the point where it's not the transplant itself, it's the concern about the ability to pay for long-term immunosuppression. And, and how do we manage that challenge, right? And there are, again, some comments in, in the, in the Q&A about the relative costs of covering dialysis, emergency dialysis, any kind of dialysis versus the cost of immunosuppression. And if we were to do an actual sort of economics evaluation that it could be cheaper, right? Um, if that's something that we actually want to, to think about um, to transplant individuals and cover that immunosuppression, but who is gonna be covering the costs? So um, I'll, I'll open it up to the rest of the panelists to, to help us think through um, ways for, you know, uh, if we were to design the, the, the system we want at the federal level, um, what are some of the steps that will get us there? Uh, Aaron, do you wanna go and then maybe Lily? Actually, I'm, uh, Dr. Cervantes, I'm more interested in what you have to say than what I have to say. Great. So please, Dr. Cervantes. <laughs> well, you know, right now there is no federal mandate uh, that provides benefits for this community. And it is explicitly excluded under the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. And so my understanding in looking at the state Medicaid uh, benefits and emergency Medicaid definitions um, or qualifying conditions is that this is done sort of on a state by state basis. And so um, I think to change this um, nationally, we would have to um, have legislative change. And I think that uh, there potentially needs to be some kind of policy analysis because I'm not sure if it would be, you know, amending the uh, 1972 Medicare um, and stage renal disease entitlement program you know, because that um, law basically um, made it so that anyone that has end-stage kidney disease has access to kidney, uh, kidney replacement therapy regardless of age. And so, you know, one question is, could we um, include undocumented immigrants in that? Um, another idea is that potentially there could be more consistency across states in the country. Um, since this is so heavily dependent on each state's Medicaid program, and I know that recently uh, Senator Bennett uh, sent a letter to President Biden basically advocating for more consistency across um, state Medicaid coverage towards outpatient COVID-19 care of undocumented immigrants because that care uh, mirrored what we're seeing with emergency dialysis, which is some states do it and some states don't. And so either advocating for more consistency across the country through Medicaid or changing uh, the laws. 
would be my approach. Um, but I think, you know, a thorough policy analysis needs to occur. And um, to be honest, um, I think we need more data. I would love, love, love to look at the UNOS data to basically get an idea of in those 16 states where undocumented immigrants can apply for a license and preemptively um, register to be organ donors in those 16 states, are we seeing a lot of organ donation from deceased undocumented immigrants? And, you know, just sort of just get an assessment of how, what this looks like, like across the country. My guess is that we would see an increase in undocumented immigrants willing to donate if we um, allowed them to receive. I think that's a perfect note to end on. We're now at 3 p.m. and uh, I'll pass it back to Elisa for any closing remarks or to Olivia. Great, thank you all so very much. And um, all of these presentations have been just phenomenal. I really appreciate it. And I also thank all of the attendees to, um, for participating and raising excellent questions. Um, we hope to address all of the remaining questions. Maybe Brian, you could speak to that. Um, but thank you all again. Yeah, um, just to echo um, Dr. Gordon's um, sentiment, thank you so much for this amazing presentation and thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, we will be downloading all the questions we did not have time for and we will answer those offline. Um, and we will also be recording, posting the recording um, to the Psychosocial and Ethics COP Hub uh, early next week. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn the recording off.